Oh, let's see here. Second Corinthians 11. I told you, did I not tell you we was going to be there a while? Did I not tell you that? I'm going to squeeze every bit I can out of that. We're going to get all the meat off the chicken bone. Not leave anything for the ants. Satan. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles. Man, I got something to show you tonight. Four o'clock. Concerning the anti-Bethel church Bethel Redding and Redding California and uh, such are false apostles deceit there we have witches practicing witches who call themselves Christian witches those two words don't go together Christian is not an adjective of witches. Okay? It's not. Um, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Do you understand that? When a witch says that she is a Christian, she has transformed herself. God did not tell her that. God, did not, God rebukes witchcraft in every form. And, uh, but I promise you, this is one case that I know of that is going on, but I promise you, it will be, it will spread out like virus, like leaven, little leaven. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The meaning of the phrase or the word Lucifer literally means angel of light, messenger of light, bearer of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Remember, I think that God judges the lost on their works. He judges the saved on their faith. We're not judged on our works except for the work that God does in us. But we are judged on our faith and faithfulness. So, we've been studying Satan for a little while, a little while. And uh, trying to understand who he is, what he does, how he does it. Um, his tactics, and we got into, last Sunday, we got into how much power he has. Good morning. How much power Satan has. So, Acts twenty six eighteen to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan, who is darkness, unto God, who is light. God is light. God is clothed with light. As with a garment, the Bible says. Uh, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Sanctified by faith. I love that. I love the sanctification that comes by grace of God through our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, to draw somebody from the power of Satan... Unto God, um, I taught this week, and I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably work that in somehow uh, to teach it here, but how man is deceived, how that works. And it really, it, it begins, it does not begin in the brain, it begins in the heart. The heart of man is the soul of man, and it's the soul that is redeemed. It is the soul that is sanctified. It is the soul that is saved the flesh is going to go to the grave it's going to corrupt and then it's going to it's going to burn uh, the chaff is always burnt off with a fire but what's inside is what's redeemed but anyway to pull somebody from the power of satan requires god to change their heart there are no magic words that you can say to a person that will instantly make them 
believe something. God has to do that. God has to awaken them. And I've seen it so many times. Um, Mike Henderson, Brother Sterling and I, God laid it on my heart to go see him. I grew up with him here at Bethel. Uh, his mom and dad were, were good Christian people and uh, always faithful in the church. Um, Mike struggled with some things in life uh, growing up in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, he got into the, got into the military. I think he was in the Navy for a while. And that did not do him any good. And he got into a lot of things that he should have never done, but he did. And God laid it on my heart one day to go see him. I did not, not even know where he was. I thought maybe he was way out of town somewhere. When I asked somebody, I asked Rose, I said, you know where Mike Henderson lives? And she said, yeah, he lives right over here across town. I said, you're kidding me. I said, no. So I knew it was from the Lord. So I went to see him one night. And I spent, I don't know, Sterling, what was, over there two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. And I was just straightforward with him. He and I were friends. We used to go door knocking, handing out tracts back, you know, back in the day. But I was just very straightforward with him, and I was getting nowhere. And he said to me, Mike, I know all this. But he said, the problem is, every time I get back in church, the devil always hits me, and I'm right back out again. He said, I'm tired of that game. And I don't blame him. He said, I'm tired of just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so he wasn't going to budge. And he finally got up and he said, I got to go to the restroom. Excuse me for a minute. While he's gone, I prayed. I said, God, I need something. Give me something to say to him. Anything. I don't care. But it's got to be from you because only you can change a man's heart. And he come back, sat down five minutes. I said something to him. Don't, meet, don't even remember what it was. And I saw him instantly. And he spoke. Stared off for a minute, and he said, I don't, have any, I don't have any argument against that. And I'm just getting doodads, you know, and, I'm, and that was from the Lord. And I said, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to let God deal with you. So we prayed and left, and he called me a couple, he, day later, a couple days later, something like that. And he said, I'll be in church Sunday morning. And uh, he said... I'll probably be down at the altar when you get done preaching. Sure enough, that's where he was. God had already dealt with him. God had already moved in him. And he came here about a year ago, something like that, two years ago, and stood up and testified of that. He never forgot that evening. I never have either. And I'm just saying to you, when it comes to talking to somebody about the Lord, you may think it's difficult, but if God gets in it, God, Jesus told us that he would give us the words to say. And he said, they will neither be able to gainsay nor resist. And that is true. It's absolutely true. But people are under the power of Satan right now. People that you know, your neighbors, your family members, close friends that you have, people on Facebook that you know, people that you went to high school with, people you used to go to church with. They are, they are under the power of Satan. And most of them don't know it. Some of them probably do and don't care. Some of them think that they can't be saved. And I don't believe that's necessarily true. But anyway, so how much power does Satan have? In Job chapter 1, very quickly, I know I touched on this last Sunday. Uh, Satan had the ability to kill everybody in Job's family. And he did. He killed all of his children, stole all of his substance, took away everything the man had except for his wife and his health. That was the first round, Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Satan answered, this is verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And that, I'll tell you something, God has put in us, a desire, it's, in a, it's an in instinct to live. An instinct to live. When a person takes their own life, they have to go against that instinct. And it's not easy to do. But anyway, people will give, they will give up everything to continue to live. Let me unhook the train for a minute and talk about this. 
I haven't mentioned it much lately, but we're living in the age where in the next 10 to 20 years, there will be significant changes in how health care is going to be designed to stop death. To stop death. There are people on this earth who have the substance and the means and the brains and the will to give up. They are, they are spending billions of dollars every year to study death and how to beat it. They are going to alter DNA, human DNA. They're going to augment it somehow. Well, I know how, but they're going to augment it. They're going to change it. They're going to rewrite man's book that God wrote for him. That's going to be an effort to stop death. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the curse in Genesis 3. Change the curse of sin and alter God's curse upon man for his transgressions. Without the cross. There, it's going to be a new gospel. See the gospel is giving us life. Everlasting life. A new gospel is going to be created. So that man no longer dies. And we know from Revelation 9. That an event happens. And nobody on earth dies. For five months. They're going to want to, but they won't be able to. They're going to suffer. But anyway, this, this verse is true. The devil's right. He will, um, he will give up everything he has for his life. People will trade in their ability to be saved in order to continue to live on this earth. Think of Esau. Esau came in from the field, famished, very hungry, and Lisa knows me, when my, when my blood sugar gets low and I need to eat something, I don't think right. Okay? I think left. Okay? I don't think right. I, I don't, my mind's messed up. And... Esau came in and he's not thinking right. He's, he demands food and Jacob says, give me your birthright. And he's going, what good is a birthright? What good is an inheritance if I'm not around to enjoy it? So he gave over his birthright. He gave over what was eternal because his birthright would have been handed down to his children. What he would have still had. He would have still, Esau would have been in the land of Canaan instead of Jacob. But he yielded that over and he gave up that he traded off what was eternal for what was temporary and that's what man does that's the decision that he makes and satan thinks that job is the same as everybody else you are asked to be like job you are asked by god you yield that over to god and say god i am willing to lay down my life for what I believe, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give up this world, including my own life, so that I can have everlasting life. If you, if you are only concerned about what you can get here and how long you can live here, then you are not right for salvation. Your heart's not right. So that's what Job figure, or that's what Satan figures about Job. But he's got the power to take Job's life. Put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan had permission from God to affect and infect Job with all manner of pain, suffering, sickness, you name it. But he was not allowed to take his life. Now we already know that Satan has the power to take life. He has the power to take it. We're actually going to read that in the scripture. He's got power over death. He is the grim reaper. 
He is the angel of death. He is a destroyer. He's a murderer. We know that from Scripture. And that's the power that he has. Satan can kill whoever he wants as long as he has God's permission. But it's interesting to me that that power, even though he has the ability to take life, it is a, its limitation is that he must do what God commands him to do. Now, some people don't think that way. Uh, the charismatic word faith movement says that Satan has all the power and if, if God is going to stop him, you must give God permission. That's a joke. I don't know who their God is, but it's not the same God as the one I serve. God is the one who is in charge of every part of his creation, including the most rebellious of them all, and that is Lucifer. God controls him. God can, can stop him. He can allow him. It's all up to God. But he has given Satan that limited power to kill whoever he wills and whoever he wants dead, they're dead. So verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd, you know what that is, just a shard of pottery, broken pottery, and he's scraping the infection off of it. He's popping the boils. And he's scraping the infection off with that potsherd. You can imagine the amount of pain that he's in. The amount of suffering that is going on. He is probably feverish. He is probably very weak. And he's probably in a lot of pain. And yet, he does not curse God. How can he do that? He has a heart that honors God, loves God, serves God, and he will not deny God. He will not turn his back on God, no matter how much pain and suffering he goes through. He has, he has lost everything. He's lost his health care. He's lost his insurance. Okay, Obamacare is gone from him. He won't work. He has no, there's, he's lost his family except for his wife. He's lost all of his possessions. He has lost everything. And now he has lost his health. A word faith believer would tell Job that obviously he's not yielding something over to God. And it's his fault that he's suffering all this. But is it Job's fault? There's not any of this that Job's fault. Job had done nothing. God said of Job that he was a righteous man and he eschewed evil. That means he, it's got the word chew in it. He literally just, he spits it out, wants nothing to do with anything evil in his life. He will not let it take hold of his life. And he is a godly man and he is, he's full of faith and he's done nothing wrong. And yet God allows this. And I want to tell you, I want to enforce and, and I want you to get this. You will suffer. You will be in pain. You will grieve. You will be tried. You will have a fiery trial, which is to try you. That is going to happen. It is not necessarily that it's because you've done something wrong. You can be living right and suffer trial, tribulation, torment, uh, persecution, devils just climbing all over you you know when you're not when you're in pain and you're not feeling well and you're very sick it plays on your mind and your emotions are not right thank god that god knows you have emotions and god knows the state you're in and your emotions want to say if you curse god you can get this over with you can just die okay this i think plays into somebody's mind who contemplates suicide, who contemplates taking their own life. It is their emotional state that messes with their decision-making process. And I believe that if a person's heart is right with God, God prevails over that. You may not have the total ability 
to say everything right, to do everything right, to put up a, what, what, they call, what I call a false front. The word faith people will tell you that if you proclaim that you feel well in Jesus' name, then you will feel well in Jesus' name. But that's lying. You don't say, I feel well in Jesus' name. You're lying. You're not being honest. God won't honor that. It's okay when somebody asks you, how are you doing? I'm not doing well. It's okay to say that. It's okay to feel that way. It's okay to have emotions that are not all full of joy and smiles and everything like that. That's the way we are. We are going to suffer persecution. We're going to suffer torment. We're going to suffer pain. But that is a punishment from Satan for serving God and not a punishment from God for not saying all the right magic words to God. Amen? So anyway, so that's, he has that limited power over the human body. All right? But the decisions, if you're a, if you're a born-again Christian, the decisions are still yours. You still have free will. You still have it. Satan cannot enforce his will over your will. He does not have that power over a born-again Christian. Now, somebody who is possessed, that's different. The devil then, who, somebody who's lost, the devils then, or a devil or devils, take over this, this man or this woman, uh, even in children, take them over, and they, in, they enforce their will in that person. That person has no will of their own. Satan has that over them. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. A couple years ago, if you remember, while you're turning there, um, we were scheduled to go to Kenya. Um, this was a return trip to Kilimambogo. We were going to be preaching there for a week and um, working with Brother Mike Hutzel, and he brought a couple of other young men that I know. And um, Michael told me that the pastors from Samburu were going to travel all the way down to Kilimambogo, and they had a gift for me. And I was pretty excited about this trip. And at that time, if you remember, Ebola had, had risen up in eastern Africa. Um, eastern Africa was at one time French colonies. French are not known for being the most clean people, okay? The British are different. British uh, colonized East Africa, the French West Africa. And so in West Africa, you had Ebola creeping up. It's a very deadly disease. Some people said, Pastor, maybe you ought not go to Kenya. Maybe that's too dangerous for you. We want to keep you, and I appreciate that. And I said... If God wants me in Kenya, I'll wake up next week in Kenya. If God doesn't want me in Kenya, I'll wake up next week in my own bed. And so we, we got to the airport. Lindsay dropped us all off, me and Sweetie Pie and um, Caleb, Alicia, and Jaden and Michaela. The lady at the Delta Airlines desk looked at all the passports and said, these children's passports, this was August, children's passports, um, their expiration date's October. We said, okay, it's two months away. We, they can't go. Why not? They have to have it updated if it's six months before their expiration date. Well, why? in case something happens and the children, you know, airlines can't make it out or whatever. And it's just once you are in a foreign country and your passport expires while you're there, it is very difficult to get it renewed while you're in a foreign country. And they said, especially with children, child trafficking and, and so on, we, we, have a, we, we didn't know that. And so... Alicia said, Dad, you can still go, but we can't. And I said, I'm not doing this again. I'm not leaving without Lisa. I, I need her 
with me. I won't do well over there. And so I made the decision right there to not go. Called Lindsay, get back up here, pick us up. She picked us up. We came back down south. We're making plans to take a vacation week. While we're down here in Festus, I hit the steering wheel. And Lisa said, what? I said, I just remembered the pastors of Sambuva were coming down to meet me and they had a gift for me. And I said, I'm upset that I'm not going to be there for them. And I thought about that and I said, why didn't I think of this while I was at the airport? And I realized, had I thought about that at the airport, I would have got on the plane and went to Kenya. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Then I started thinking, why didn't, why didn't I think of this while I was at the airport? Why didn't I? Because by then, it was already too late. that We had missed the flight. Why didn't I think of this at the airport? So then God began to teach me. Mike, you said, if I don't want you in Kenya, you're going to wake up in your own bed. And that's what's going to happen tomorrow morning. You're going to wake up in your own bed. I don't want you there this time. Now, I, to this day, do not know why. And Mike Hutzel took my gift. Okay? I don't know why God didn't want me there, but he obviously did not want me there because if, had he wanted me there, I would have thought the right thoughts. I would have jumped on that plane. God would have directed me to do that. I totally believe that. So, then God began, he reminded me that Satan can even hinder the work of God. Now, why does God allow Satan to do that? I'm not sure of all the reasons, but let's look at the scripture. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. Paul says this, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which, is, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. That gives you an insight into the Jewish people, their mindset. And have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. How true is that statement? It's absolutely, and Paul's saying this of his own people. He said, we're wicked people. We, not only are we despised of everybody, we despise everybody. I mean, the Catholics hate the Baptists, and the Buddhists hate the Hindus, but everybody hates the Jews. Okay? So why is that? That's just, but God loves them, and God's going to save them. So, watch this now. Verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all way. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. And that also is true. Verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we should, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And I, I, when the next day we left and went on vacation, we stopped in Memphis. We were just going wherever the wind blew. We were in Memphis, Tennessee, and we checked into the hotel, and I'm laying there in the bed, and I'm thinking about this, and I pull the scriptures up, and I'm looking at this passage, and the Holy Ghost said, Mike, Think of Paul. To, now, in my opinion, Paul is the greatest Christian in the whole world ever and ever will be. The, the most godly man, the best preacher, best evangelist, best church builder, best uh, theologian, best everything. The, he's got it all. He's an apostle. He wrote most of the New Testament. But if Satan can hinder Paul... Who am I? Who am I? I'm not more powerful than Satan. I'm not greater than Paul. Nothing like that. And God said, Mike, if I let Satan hinder Paul, who are you? So Satan hindered the work. Satan will hinder you. He will stand against you. He will oppose you. He will stop you. From doing things in God's will. But God allows it. 
for whatever reason, I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know who, is, have you ever played chess or checkers? Have you ever sacrificed one of your own men as part of a greater play? Now some of you are shaking your head like you sacrifice your own men, but the, your problem is you're a bad checker player. Okay? <laughs> or you just lose, okay? But there are times when you sacrifice your own men and let the other opponent gain an advantage, but your plan is to overcome them because of that. You want them in that place so you can do something else. So I believe that our world is God's chessboard. And God is, he is all powerful over all the pieces, both sides. And God will lead Satan to get a temporary victory, but God win the war. God allowed Satan to possess Judas Iscariot to get Judas to, to turn his back on Jesus, to turn him over to the Sanhedrin, to the Jews and the Roman government, so he could be crucified. And they crucified God. They crucified the Son of God. They crucified the Savior of mankind. But in that crucifixion was our salvation. And Satan didn't see that. It's like when Frankie beat me in checkers. That rat made a move that I never saw coming. First time I played him, I'm going, he beat me. Bless his heart. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. I miss him. But anyway, that's what Satan will do. God will allow Satan to hinder the work, but it's always for God. Remember what God said. All things, let's say this out loud. All things work together for the good to them who are the called according to his purpose. His purpose. God's purpose. All things, even Satan's hindering of us, will always work for God's glory and God's, um, God's good. Okay? So even when you don't understand why the devil's standing against you, the devil's not letting you pray, the devil's not letting you... You know, sometimes you can sit there, read your Bible, and you'll read the same chapter 20 times and not get one thing out of it. And it's just like there's Satan has just taken over your mind. He's got your mind scrambled on everything in the world except his word. He's hindering you. He doesn't let you get on a plane. He doesn't let you talk to somebody about the Lord. He doesn't let you do this. He doesn't let you come to church one Sunday. He don't let you do things. He's got the power to do it. God allows him to do it at times. But God always gets the victory. Always. Okay? So he can hinder the work of God. Daniel chapter 10. Turn there. We have an example of this. We have this. Uh, in, we, have, we have an angel who is sent to Daniel. And Satan won't let him get there. Daniel chapter 10. Satan is a very powerful angel. Very powerful. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, from, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before, the God, before thy God. Uh, let me just throw this in very quickly. If you chasten yourself, God won't have to. Amen? Think about that. Ponder that. Okay? When you not doing right, not living right, not thinking right. Okay? Sin creeps in. Old sins, old habits, old thoughts, old things. Okay? The mark of a godly person is that they will chasten themselves. So God won't have to. Had I thought about that as a child, I might have saved myself from some whippings. But knowing my mother, I would have got it double. I would have chased him. I would have whipped myself. And then mom said, I'll whip you too. How's that? 
Because I, I, listen, my mom was old school and righteous. Because if you got a beating at school, you got a, you come home, you got a beating. You got a paddling at school, you got a whipping at home. Double. But anyway, chasing yourself, okay? That way God doesn't have to do it. And that's a righteous person, that's what they do. But he said, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. When you pray, listen to me. When you pray, God heard it. But you don't always get an immediate response. In fact, maybe I could say very seldom would you get an immediate response. Sometimes it happens. But don't always expect this answer back. God always waits for a perfect time. Does he not? Y'all, y'all know that. You know that. God always has a time and a season for everything under the sun. There is a time and a season. So, he's telling Daniel, Daniel, don't, don't worry. When you prayed, we all heard it. All of us angels heard it. God heard it. And God immediately sent the answer to you. However, verse 13 but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Prince of the kingdom of Persia. Principality is what we're studying. Um, talked about it last Sunday night. A little bit tonight. Principalities. A prince of the kingdom of Persia. An angel. Probably Satan. Withstood me one and twenty days. Three weeks. Because three times seven is 21. I know, I remember that from third grade. Okay? 21 days, Daniel had to wait for the angel to be able to, to deliver the response from God. And what a tremendous response it was. But that's how long Satan hindered, or the prince of the kingdom of Persia, uh, that's how long this evil angel held up God's messenger, would not let him through, would not let him pass. Uh, how that works, I don't understand. Okay, they have swords, I know that. And maybe they got into a 21-day sword fight, I don't know. Maybe uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia stood there with a sword aimed or an arrow aimed or whatever. Fire ready to shoot out of his nose or whatever, I don't know. But he would not let this angel... Come near to Daniel for 21 days. And then Michael had to step in. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, a principality, a, a very high, in fact, probably the highest ranking angel, second only to what would have been Lucifer. Lucifer would have been the chief of all the angels as he stood Covering the throne of God. That he is the anointed cherub that covereth. But, and we know that Michael then, Revelation 12, is going to go to war against Satan, the dragon, and all of his angels, a third of the angels. And again, from third grade, I remember that two-thirds is bigger than one-third. Amen? Okay? If there's three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches... And me and Melissa, I'm going to get two of them. She's not going to get but one. That's better. But like Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And in verse 20, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So he's going back. The prince of Persia did not run away. He's still there. And this angel's going back to help Michael fight the prince of Persia. And I just, I believe the prince of Persia could very well be Satan himself. Because Revelation 12, we have Michael and his angels. And this one, this angel would be one of those that fights with Michael. Are fighting uh, 
the dragon and one-third of the angelic realm, the evil angels, and they're going to prevail and they're going to be cast out of heaven. All right? So, gives you a little glimpse then in the power that Satan has. He has power to hint, not, listen to this, he has power not only to hinder your prayers when you pray them, but he has power to hinder the response. Okay? God answering back. God allows this for whatever his reasoning is, but it always works together with everything else for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. Don't, I'm going to say don't worry, but that's not going to work. Because you're going to worry. That's natural. But be assured and have the hope that when you prayed, God heard it. You may, it may have taken you three weeks to pray. Because Satan hindered you. If Satan can hinder an angel, who are you? Okay? But remember, greater is he that is, say it with me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being in us. And always thanks be to God, which always give us the victory. And triumph, causes us to triumph in every place. Father, thank you for this word. Help us to understand our enemy. Help us to understand the power that he has. Help us, dear God, when we're struggling to pray. And we can't even think of the words and we're so bitter in our spirit that we don't even want to. That God overcome and God help us. When Satan stands against us to hinder us, God help the holy angels. When Satan withstands them to hinder your answer, God empower us, empower them. Lord, to always stand against the devil. We know, Father, that if we stand against Satan... Eventually, he'll have to flee because you being in us is greater than he ever was, ever will be, ever thinks to be. You are greater in us than he is. Father, thank you for this good word. Teach, Lord, teach us. Show us, God. Maybe, maybe, Lord, you just introduced this to somebody who did not know it. Or maybe, God, you just reminded somebody today and they needed to hear it. I pray, Lord, that it be a blessing to somebody. Thank you, God, for loving us, for sending us this good word. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.